Uh, our final session segs a little bit, or kind of is the other bit of bread in the sandwich that was buttered earlier by um, Joanne, when she was talking about the changing educational landscape, the opportunities for collaborations, but also around the national agenda, um, which is very much around um, formal uh, partnerships between schools in multi-academy trusts. And uh, our next speaker is going to be talking about some of the implications around that, some of the possible structures and some of the detail. Um, I would have been introducing Mark Blois from um, Brown Jacobson, but Mark can't speak because he lost his voice yesterday. And so I, I've been thinking of other metaphors or analogies. One was um, maybe we're getting Trump instead of Clinton. No. Uh, what I think I prefer to think of it as we're, what we're getting here is um, Ronaldo coming on for um, coming on for Gareth Bale. So um, it, it's actually Adrian Shardlow uh, from Brown Jacobson who I introduced for our final session. You could say Adrian's cart drops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yes, I, I've got a random Gareth Bale story actually. I was working on behalf of Gareth Bale's school in London uh, a while ago, like many years ago, because before he went across to Real Madrid, and his manager rang the head teacher, and the head teacher was thinking, This is great, we might be getting somebody to come in and inspire the kids. And the manager was just saying, Could you tell us when your break times are? Because he keeps going to Sainsbury's next door and getting mobbed. And he wants to go in when the kids are at school, not when they're <laughs> I've been asked to talk today about um, academies and multi-academy trust. Um, we've put together quite an extensive number of slides, which I cannot possibly get through. So I'd just like to pull through the major threads in those slides, actually, if that's OK. Um, <clears throat> and we can make the slides available to you in due course. Um, just a quick show of hands. Can anybody show me who's in a multi-academy trust at the moment? Who's in a standalone academy? Empty multi-academy trust, if you know what those are. A community school? Church school? BA? Oh, yeah. BC. Foundation, yeah. You've got everything, haven't you? Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, uh, just a quick horizon scan for the moment, by the way. Um, we, we obviously know that the white paper has now been abandoned, so the DfE have abandoned their proposal to force every school to be an academy <coughs> trust. Um, <clears throat> must bear in mind that it's still their intention that every school will become an academy in due course, and that, that they're pushing very hard, certainly at the bottom end, schools that are struggling to force them to become academy trusts, so bear that in mind. But the message is don't panic, but work at your own pace. Uh, and the biggest message that's coming from the DfE at the moment is about collaborating. Collaborating with other schools, building strong bonds, supporting each other. If and when the time comes to support a school that's in difficulty, then you can take the right steps to support that school. That's the biggest message that's coming through. But they are forcing through academies as well. So just to bear in mind, if you don't know if you're aware of the Education Adoption Act, which came into force on the 18th of April this year, that made a significant change to what the Secretary of State can do with a school that is Grade 4 Ofsted. Because prior to that act, um, the, there was a power. It said the Secretary of State may make an academy order if a school goes Grade 4. May. And because the word in there was may, we used to get instructed by schools to say, she's exercising that discretion heavy-handed, can you stop it for us? And we used to stop it. The Education Adoption Act changed the word from may to must. So if a school is Grade 4, the Secretary of State must make an academy order. So if you go to grade four, you must become an academy. There's absolutely no choice. So you're in fast-flowing water then, and you've got to take a lot of decisions, and you may have to go into a sponsor map unless you've already got a collaboration that you know can support you in a multi-academy trust. So just bear in mind, it's not, it's don't panic, but bear in mind that schools are being attacked from the bottom. So if you are in grade four, then you will be forced to become an academy. And we've also got the coasting schools agenda coming in after that as well. Um, I was speaking at a conference yesterday in London uh, for ASCIL and the National Schools Commissioner, Sir David Carter, spoke after me and he said that when you look at the, the tests that are being used for coasting schools, just looking at secondary schools, there's about 102 secondary schools um, where their progression is minus 0.25%, so they would be considered to be coasting. And nearly a quarter of those were good or outstanding by Ofsted, so they think they're okay but they're potentially not, so just bear those things in mind. So talking about Academy Trust, um, the first thing is just to describe what an Academy Trust is, because there's often a misunderstanding of what, what, what Academy Trust is. An Academy is an independent school. So if you look at autonomy from the local authority, those of you that are maintained schools, the local authority employs your staff, the local authority manages your premises, but you're maintained and you're top slice, obviously, as maintained schools are. Work through autonomy through to, say, the foundation schools, where the foundation schools will employ their staff and own their premises. 
so there's more autonomy. And then go right over here to the independent sector. Private schools employ their own staff, own their own building, and charge for their education. An academy is an independent school, but it's in the state sector because it contracts with the Secretary of State. And it contracts to go back into their obligations of um, admissions, exclusions, and all the things that you would do as a community school. <coughs> but it's run by this Academy Trust charity. So it's an Academy Trust charitable company that runs the academy and contracts with the Secretary of State to provide, in effect, a, a state-funded education. So when you create an Academy Trust, you set up a charitable company. And that company is this new legal entity completely. And the local authority transfers everything over to that charity. And that charity then runs the school. And all academies out there will be in a form of Academy Trust, whether it's a single or a multi. And like all charities and all companies, they have something called Articles Association. That's that company rule book that tells them what they can do. And every company has an object, and it's the advancement of education. So if any of those academy trusts try to run a pub or an estate agency, they're in breach, and they would be closed down in effect, because all they can do is advance education. That's what the charity is giving it, uh, receiving funding to do. And when you set up these companies, these charitable companies, unlike your own schools that will have a governing body, and then the senior leadership team, in these charities they have two groups of people called members and directors. Um, and the directors are confusingly also called trustees, and they're also in a standalone academy trust, governors. So if you're a standalone, if you're a school now and you create your own standalone academy, all of your governors become trustees and directors of that company. And you also have a group of people called members. I'll just talk about the trustees first because it makes sense to you understand what your governors are doing. <coughs> if you create an academy trust, your governors also become they have the core functions of governance that you have as governors, so ensuring the vision, etc., ensuring the executive perform their responsibilities, sound proper effective use of the financial resources. <coughs> but they've also got duties under company law and duties under charity law as well. And most of those could take hours talking about those, but if we just say don't commit fraud or run away with the money, that's the main things that we're looking at. You're, you're looking at exercising independent judgment. Um, being uh, promoting the success of the Academy Trust and, and duties like that as well. But the role of the trustees in an Academy Trust, they are the governors and they're also directors and trustees. But you also have these people called members. And members sit outside the trustees and they are the people who are initially set up the company. You normally only have three, three to five people who are members in an Academy Trust. And they're a bit like shareholders. I have to say, most academies out there, probably their members don't really understand their roles because it's a difficult role to understand. But they're a little bit like shareholders in that they have certain reserve powers. If we collectively had shares in British Gas, we would have a role in British Gas. It wasn't a day-to-day -day role of telling them how too much to charge for the gas or, or, or who to employ, but collectively we could remove the board and collectively we could close the company. So they're sort of a custodian role. Shareholders are custodians. But they also get the benefit of a dividend, of course. Whereas in a charitable company, the members don't get the benefit, but they do have this backseat role. So only the members can wind up the trust, amend the company rule book, appoint other members, remove trustees, or actually change the name. So they, they're sort of they're custodians, but they don't have a day-to-day -day role. Compare that with the trustees who are in there, just as governors are managing, managing the schools. Some recent changes actually on who can be members. So if any of you are Academy Trust from say two years ago, um, it will be run in a different way to the way that Academy Trusts are now run. The DfE built this plane in the air um, and it's been changed a little bit over time to make sure that it can fly on land. So we're six years in now and there's a few changes now. So the DfE prefer there to be five members. Historically there used to be three members so there had to be unanimity to reach any conclusion and somebody might disagree and then you couldn't get any business done. So now they, they allow five members. And they don't allow any employee to be one of these members. Now, in all the earlier trusts, the principal was always a member. In all, in all of the earlier trusts. And you can no longer have any employee as a member now. So that's another change as well. And another significant change, and I'll move on to this in multi-academies in a little while. And that's, it's the members that will appoint the trust board in all new trusts that are being created. They're not appointed from schools within automatically. So we're not looking at a stakeholder model. I'll talk about what I mean by stakeholder model in the multi-academy trust in a little while. Um, so this is an example of what we see. This is a sample structure of a multi-academy trust. All multi-academy trusts are in this format of some kind. I mentioned the company. Now in a standalone academy trust, one company, one school, it feels like one and the same thing. So if you're running a standalone academy trust, your governors feel like they're doing the same thing. They do wear hats as 
company directors and trustees, but they feel like they're running their school, so it feels the same. When you go to a multi-academy trust, the company and the schools feel separate. They, they, there is a distinction between them. And in this example, above the dotted line, you've got the company, you've got the charity. Below the dotted line, you've got the schools within. And you might have, there's one with nearly 80 schools within. <coughs> uh, AET is upwards of 70 at least. 80% of multi-academy trusts have got two to five schools in there. 80% out there. There's, there's about 730 multi-academy trusts out there. Um, the DfE will tell you there's about 900. They include multi-academy trusts with only one school in it at the moment, so they're not really multis. But there's about 750 of, and 80% have only got two to five schools. And they were locally created to help each other and to support each other. And there's only 2% of MATs have got more than 21 schools in them. Only 2%. That's a big number, but the DfE would like an awful lot of MATs to be that number of schools, actually. But you'll see most of them are small and local. But it's important to understand what a MAT is because a lot of people don't really understand that there's only one legal entity in a multi-academy trust. There's only one company. There's one company that employs every teacher, every teaching assistant, every member of staff across all the four schools. Four schools is employed by that one company. There's only one legal entity that can hold the land title, that can hold the leases to the, to the premises. <coughs> So if you create this, if four schools come together and say we want to create a map please, <clears throat> you need to know you're creating that one company and it's a proper hard collaboration. It's like a hard federation. Um, it's the closest example we can give. But if you're joining someone else's trust, if you're here looking from the outside and you want to come in here and sit here, bear in mind that you are transferring your school to that company. And you as a governing body become, in effect, a local committee of the trust board. And so in this example, every local governing body, and the NGA hate this phrase now, they don't like local governing body, they prefer local governing committee, because they think it accurately represents, and it does, accurately represents what you are in a multi academy trust. You're all local governing committees. And then, this local governing body will look after Academy 4 through a scheme of delegation that is passed down from the Board of Trustees. Full responsibility is on the heads of these people up there. <coughs> all the trustees, and usually in a mat, you have a smaller number of trustees than you would in a standalone, because in a standalone, every governor is a trustee as well. But in a mass, you'll have eight to ten people will be trustees. And then you might have a slightly larger number, perhaps 11 people will sit as local governors. And there's a scheme of delegation down, and that scheme of delegation will advise the local governing board body what they can do, what their powers are. Usually, it's a complete full scheme of delegation that says, get on with it, run the school, it's fine. Now, it has to be borne in mind that because the responsibilities with the Board of Trustees, they can delegate duties and they can delegate decision making, but they cannot delegate the responsibility. So if you are going to be a governor on a Board of Trustees, the responsibility for a child in Academy 1 is yours. <coughs> Even if you, in effect, came from Academy 4. Because you are <coughs> responsible for every child across the whole of the multi-academy <coughs> trust. So it is a big responsibility. But also bear in mind that if you're sitting here as a local governor, if you don't perform and this school starts to struggle, do you remember I said if you get grade 4 Ofsted as a maintained school, you can be forced to be in an academy. If you're in an academy trust, a mat, and you get grade 4, the DfE can what they call rebroker, which means move the school away and put it into somebody else's multi-academy trust. So if you create your friendly group of four, and then you don't support one of those schools, it is still at risk of being taken away and put somewhere else. You can't, as local governors, put your fingers in your ears and tell the trustees to keep out of it. It's your business, it's your school. Because they are responsible. And because they're responsible, they can remove the scheme of delegation. Or remove you as local governors to say, we've got to sort it out because we're responsible for every child. So one thing to bear in mind that it is a proper merging of legal responsibility. But the schools all have this sort of dotted line around them as an educational identity. So they have their own unique reference number. Every school continues to have its own unique reference number, has its own Ofsted, and funding is allocated by reference to your pupil cohort. But bear in mind that the LGB is a committee of the, of the board, and that's important to understand it that way. <coughs> now, most mats will top slice. What they'll do is they say, we provide, we'll provide some form of funding uh, we'll provide some form of service, sorry, to, to, to the schools within, and we'll top slice. And that's anywhere between 3 to 5.5%, something like that, in order to provide some kind of central services. Now, in the early days, Max used to say, come and join us, we won't interfere with you. Just join us and we'll let you carry on. Um, what the DfE is saying was, 
That was the reason a lot of maths failed, because actually they said, just come along and we won't take an interest in running your school and driving up performance and helping you to, to, to do well. So in other words, if you have a top size of only half a percent because we're not providing anything, what's the point of joining that map? Where is the support and collaboration in that organisation? A lot of schools created maps because they thought it was a way of just allowing the DFE their, their wish, was to get them to be academies, but then they weren't really going to collaborate in any way properly. Um, but they can provide, they can provide services, and they should provide services for a top slice. The mat isn't funded independently, so it has to, it has to provide those services through a top slice. But there are real advantages. Some advantages of these are things like, if there's lots of smaller schools here with influential staff, and one member goes off on maternity leave or sick leave, and you've got Ofsted coming in a few weeks' time, and you need someone that understands your group and understands your ethos, you hopefully can second somebody within your group. So the, the ability there. To, to keep your good staff and use your, your good staff to the best advantage are in, is in the MAP model. Things like attracting good staff as well. So if you're in a larger organisation, you attract good staff. Economies of scale, in all honesty, you've got to get up to 10 or so before you can really drive economies of scale in a multi-academy trust. People always talk about economies of scale, but actually, realising them, given that most of your costs are your people, it's very hard to get economies of scale in small amounts, but you tend to get them when you grow a little bit larger. But that's the map structure. One company with committees running the schools within. So I always get asked questions on autonomy, finance, and Ofsted. They're the big things. If you're going to join a map, what happens to those three things? In terms of the finances, um, there is a funding is allocated by reference to the pupil cohort, pupil premium, etc., within each of the schools. What then happens is the map will decide on a top slice. That can happen in a number of ways. The money can go upwards or downwards. So the money can come into each school and the MAT says pay us 5% a month. Or the money can go to the top and the MAT will pay the salaries and then they can give you 95% of it going down. The most effective and efficient organisations would have one payroll function. And they say to their schools now, join us. You don't have to deal with the legal side. You don't have to deal with the payroll side. You can concentrate on the education side. And they will have central functions to pay all these things at top level. So they're the ones that really work most effectively. But it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a, it's a shift of thinking to move into the proper joined up operation. <coughs> and the best maths work. In the best maths, it's not about the finances, the structure, the legal side of it. It's about your ethos and your vision. If you've all got the same ethos, you've all got the same vision, if you've collaborated for a long time before you did this, then usually the map has better chance of doing well and driving up standards across. And the idea is, of course, in this scenario, if Academy 4 is absolutely flying on numeracy, then why not give the person that's running numeracy there an overarching role to try and help the other schools to fly on numeracy as well. So the idea is that you collaborate to bring out the best in your students. That's the best way of dealing with it. Um, the problem with top sizing, of course, is some schools may feel that it's not fair to them, and there is a, there's a, an appeal mechanism within the what's called the Academy's Financial Handbook, which is a rule, that, a rule book that all academies must comply with, that if... One academy feels the top slicing isn't working for them, they can appeal to the trust board. And if they don't get satisfaction there, they can appeal to the EFA as well. I've never seen it done, but it's in the, in the mechanism there. There are some right-wing think tanks that are saying, actually, give all the money to the map. They can decide what to do with the money. They can decide to put it where they need it. That's a radical shift change for individual schools, thinking, well, I don't really necessarily want all the money to go to the map. And it's certainly not something that's proposed at the moment, but it was a think tank paper that came out about a month ago. In terms of offset, each school in the map gets its own category. So if you're in a four-school map and one of the other schools gets outstanding, you can cheer, but you're only cheering for them, not for you, because you're not going up with them, of course. But if they go down, similarly, you, you don't suffer. But reputationally, it could be an issue. And there may also be a dip test of the other schools to see if the maps are doing the right thing. And it's been suggested, and there are proposals, to grade the mat itself. And I think it would be a great idea to grade the map going forward, because I think they do need to be responsible for what they're doing as a trust board as well. So I think it's important to grade the maps going forward as well. In terms of governance, I mentioned that you have local governing committees at school level. The board tend to create a uh, <coughs> finance committee, but then you have local governing committees at school level. And I've mentioned what the local committee is. This is a, a picture of representation of the situation. <coughs> this is an alternative to the local governing body model. So I mentioned the typical model is you have a governing body or governing committee. If the schools are not performing particularly well, a map might have advisory boards instead of local governing committees, so they're not delegating decision making. They're saying, right, we'll have a board at each school. They're, they're the eyes and ears of the school, and they can inform the board so the board can take decisions. But what they're not doing is taking decisions as local governing bodies. 
It's more frequent for local government bodies to take decisions and run their schools. But I go to many schools where the reason they're joining a map is because they've got an IEB in, the head teacher's no longer there, they're on their knees and they're being sponsored by a map. And so the trust board has to take responsibility, take control. So they'll normally put in an advisory board, but not a local government body. Um, I mentioned advisory boards don't have a decision making power there. There's no scheme of delegation down to them. <coughs> um, a bit complicated this one, but it's just to show that there are lots of different possibilities available. So you can now have a local governing committee that doesn't just look after one school, but can look after a cluster of schools. So in this model, you've got, I can do my maths, 12, you've got 12 academies there. And in effect, you've only got three local governing committees. And then you've only got three. You've got three executive head principals that are responsible for four head teachers each. So that's some of the <coughs> so there, is, there are a number of maps that operate like that, where their governance has been divided up because they've become so, so big. Now, the National Schools Commissioner, Dave Carter, was saying yesterday, everybody thinks that the failure of some of the early maps was they grew too quickly. They, grew, they, they were allowed to take on too many schools. I, I agree with that, actually. I do think he doesn't. Um, he's got a different view on it, but I also agree with his view which is the reason why they suffered was because they didn't have a school improvement policy when they took schools on. So they took them on without a real idea of what they were going to do with those schools. Secondly, he said they didn't have a system of bringing on leaders within the organisation that could take responsibility for school disrupting in it as well. And the third one was they were, street, they were stretching too far geographically. How can you support a school if it's 30 miles away and it's going to take you half an hour to drive there and half an hour to get back? So the idea was... Um, if you can grow, <coughs> manage growth is the new message, and I quite like that message of do what you're good at, take your time, if you're going to grow, manage your growth. Don't just say yes to the commissioner when they ring you up and say there's a school around the corner, would you take it on, or this school 30 miles away, could you go and support it? If it comes into your map, it's your responsibility. So it's all cosy on the telephone call saying can you take that school down, but once it's on your books, it's your school and your responsibility. Um, and I mentioned cluster governing bodies there as well. Can I ask um, you a question? Can you have a mixture, or is that what you've got from there? You can mix it. You can mix so you it. can have a mixture of local government committees, local school committees, and advisory boards. Yeah, you pre to the next slide, which is that. <laughs> you're absolutely right. You can. Yeah. So what you can have in this example, all these schools are doing well. They've all got... No, no, you keep asking. Keep asking. These schools are doing well. They've all got local governing bodies. At this end, the schools are not doing so well, so they've all got advisory boards. Uh, and because you, quite possibly, these are the schools that this map took on on a sponsor relationship, so they're all struggling, and the DfE persuaded them to take these on with a bit of extra funding for sponsoring them to help them out. Whereas these schools became almost partner schools, they've all got the local governing bodies helping them to run their schools. Um, and this is called earned autonomy, in effect. So in other words, you can move from here to here by earning your autonomy. So once you're doing quite well, you'll pop over here. There was a suggestion in the early days of academisation well, I think the Labour administration said you should have the right to leave a mat if you get outstanding. So if you get outstanding, you can go. But the problem with that was it would leave the mats with a problem. It would leave the mats with all the schools that are struggling and none of the expertise necessary to bring them out of that. So that didn't make a lot of sense. Um, there is a model called mixed mats. Um, there's a number of phrases out there. You, you may have heard of these. Have you heard of a phrase called... Um, well, mixed mats is where you've got church schools and non-church schools mixing together in a multi-academy trust structure. If you're a VC school, currently the diocese has the right to appoint up to 25% of your governors. If you're a community school, obviously the diocese doesn't have any involvement in that school. <coughs> if you're a VC school, you've also got a situation where the diocese will own the buildings, whereas the local authority will own the playing fields. If you're going to create a multi-academy trust, all those interests need to be protected. And there's a model called the mix mat, where the diocese will have the right to appoint up to 25% of the trustees, and up to 25% of the local governors as well. Whereas in the church school, the local governors will not be appointed by the diocese. And that is believed to satisfy everybody's needs in that scenario. So there's a mixed map model there. But it is subject to the agreement of your diocese. So any church school that wants to convert must have the diocese and approval to, to enter that model. But there is a model available. Uh, and that just explains that a little bit further. Other phrases you might... Have you heard of uh, mates maps? Yeah. Mates map. It's used in more than one scenario, actually. But one scenario is where... You've got five schools all over the county. They're, you can't work out why they are working together. They seem to have a different ethos, seem to they're in geographically um, apart, until you find out that all the head teachers went to college together. And then you realise, ah, I see. 
Uh, and the problem there, of course, is if one of the head teachers retires or, or, or is posted somewhere else, there's no structure for having those schools together. There's no real rationale for that. Another example of mates maths is where all the good and outstanding schools get together and form a mat and are not supporting schools that need that support. And the DfE are very keen to stop that practice. Um, the whole purpose of this is school-to-school -school support and collaboration. The idea is give and take. In an ideal example, the DfE will say, each school is a giver and receiver of support. And, and so the idea is if you get a proper, proper mat structure, they're not mates mats. Uh, and around the country there are lots of schools and collaborations saying we want to get together and we're all good. And actually there's a good strategy for that at the beginning. Because there's no point creating a mat and taking on a struggling school if you've not got capacity for it. So if you can build two or three good, strong schools in a mat, then you can look at taking on a struggling school. The worst stories I've heard are in the early days of a good school becoming a good academy and thinking they can be a good mat without doing due diligence on their own capacity. And then struggling as governors, having a terrible year, seeing a leadership team not trusting the governors because of what they've put them through and all that. So you need to understand your strategy before you do that. So a mates mat is where everything comes together um, and they're not supporting other schools. Um, turning to leadership in mats, um, I used to often get a, a, a request. I'd sit in a room with, with, with four schools and they would say, <clears throat> we want to create a mat, but we don't want any leadership, please. Uh, which is a worrying concept if you think about it objectively. But what they actually meant was, we're all doing well, we've all got good head teachers, we don't want a senior executive, chief executive officer, we don't want an executive principal, we just want to carry on as we are, but on an equal basis. Um, and the DfE used to have uh, an equivocal stance on that, so some of the commissioners wouldn't allow it, and some would. And you need your regional schools commission of permission when you're going to put a project together. So those kind of, we used to call them flat mats as well, used to go ahead. Now, it's all changed now because as of September, there's a new Academy's Financial Handbook came out, and the DfE have now announced you must have a chief, you must have what they call a senior executive leader in a multi family trust. Now, in a standalone Academy trust, you have the principal, and the principal is usually what's called the accounting officer. The accounting officer is responsible to Parliament for where the money goes. So if that money goes where it shouldn't go, that person can be standing before a select committee talking about where the money went and apologising. Often, principals don't understand that, so if you're in an academy trust at the moment, your principal might not be aware of that responsibility. In a multi-academy trust, that role is usually held by one, it will be held by one person, and the DfE want that person to be the either executive principal or the senior executive leader, or CEO as they call them. Now, the DfE spotted a bit of a scam there, because many schools would say, we don't want a CEO, but we've got four schools coming together. They won't approve it at the DfE. So Julie will do it in year one, and then Bill will do it in year two, and then we'll just rotate it as we go on. And they spotted that, so now they've got a rule in the Economist Financial Handbook that you can't rotate the CEO role, uh, which was quite clever, actually, for the DfE. They spotted something there. Um, but what they have said, in order to get projects off the ground, is you can have an interim, an interim CEO. If you just want to get it off the ground first, they will accept that. Uh, one of my jobs, I used, to, I used to, well, I still do, go into lots of rooms where I might have six schools, and they know there's got to be a CEO, and none of the head teachers want to do it. But none of them will say it. And I'll go into other rooms where there's six people, and everybody wants to be the, the CEO, and no one will say it. And I don't know which room I'm in. So we've really, really got to the crux of it. The worst room to be in is where one person wants to be the CEO, yeah, no different. one wants them to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of those rooms. <laughs> but bearing in mind, there has to be a CEO. And actually, that job is quite a big job, because it's about strategy of the group. It's about driving up standards across the group. It's about making something happen, because the trusts that don't go anywhere don't have a vision, don't have energy, don't have drive. The ones that do move are... are Personally, I, 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 it's a joy to see them, it's a joy to get... I go to some of their annual awards, for example, and it's, it's, it's fantastic when they bring all the kids in and give awards from groups across, across the maths as well. Um, so talking about leadership and this role, this is a typical example. This is one example of three special schools I converted. They didn't have a head teacher, they had one head teacher rather. At each school they didn't have a head teacher, they had heads of school. And then they had one head teacher. But when they converted, they just stayed the same. The executive principal stayed as an executive principal in that multi-academy trust role. So that's how that went. Um, and it carried on that this person had the substantive role of head teacher for all three schools. It's more common to have this model, where you've got head, three head teachers come together who want to create a multi academy trust, and they will normally appoint one of them also to act as the executive head principal, uh, executive principal as well. 
I don't know where that came from, it's just flown in. That doesn't really wrong understanding. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, this person also acts as executive principal. There's a cost to that because this person's going to be doing a bigger role. So you do have to meet a cost of that. And you need to think what can you afford to do in this, uh, in this level. And if they're going to be saving, some of those will be in leadership and, and management, etc. Um, and this will come out of the top slice, of course, because you'll be a top slice of 5% or whatever. And you'll have to see, is this, is this a full-time role? Is it a part-time role? How many hours a week will it, will it require? It becomes a bigger role as, as, as the group grows, of course. And I mentioned that 80% are, are 2 to 5. That's not what the DFD would like. They would love you to grow to between 10 and 20. That, that's their ideal, really, going forwards. Now, when, when the group gets bigger, you have a, a genuine CEO. Now, I've got this situation here of two schools, and he's a principal. Now, he calls himself a CEO because he likes the phrase. That's fine. You can be a CEO of two. But normally, the CEO role is described when you've got someone who's not in a head teaching post. Their job is strategy. Their job is looking at your policies, looking at your procedures, looking at some groups and seeing what the problems are, holding the head teachers to account, proper line management. Line management in the head teacher world is a difficult subject to broach actually because many schools have been out there and the head teacher doesn't really feel line managed. But when you get yourself into a multi academy trust, <laughs> it may be the first time you're saying somebody's going to be a line manager of each teacher in there. And that, that is the way it works. The DFE has seen it's the way it works. But the head teachers can sometimes take some persuading. Um, now, the CEO doesn't have to be a teacher. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a business role, actually. But interestingly, Sir Michael Wilshire, in his October bulletin, he sends out the expectorate bulletins, looked at a lot of the high-performing trusts, and he picked seven in particular, and he said six of those had an ex-head teacher of the CEO, and it makes sense, doesn't it? You need to understand the data, you need to understand what you need to do in school, so it does obviously make sense to have somebody who was a head, was a head teacher to be the CEO of, of a multi academy trust. Um, <clears throat> so in this model, where you do have a CEO, you have a head teacher at every school, the CEO has an overarching strategic role, and doesn't have legal responsibility as a head teacher. Uh, and this brings in this point, that when you're in a multi academy trust, you are all in it together, and there is, up, there has to be some loss of autonomy. It doesn't mean that the schools can't have their own feel, their own flavour, their own ethos. But there has to be some loss of autonomy in this because you will decide at some point whether you want to have, well, you will need to have a standard complaints policy, terms and conditions, all those things that you need to have consistency on. Things like having standard paperwork for local governing body meetings. Because if the board need to read lots and lots of these reports, it makes sense if they're all in the same format rather than all over the place because it's how you did it at your school before. So there has to be standardisation in doing this to try and help drive through. And also, there has to be a decision taken somewhere. What's working? What, a common curriculum is a fantastic thing to have across a multi-academy trust. Um, and then the leadership model can grow. So this is a typical large mat. So in this mat, they went to an executive head model, actually, where they had heads of school, an executive head with heads of school, and the CEO was strategy, and they appointed a chief operating officer to do the business end. And when they get big, there is a business end. There's a lot, even brand management, believe it or not. If you want to attract the good teachers, you need a good reputation. If you want to, uh, if, if you want to succeed, you want to attract the, the good people to work inside your organisation, you've got to have a good reputation as well. Interesting as well, I think, this is my own personal view, when some mats grow to seven or so, they suddenly become the bogeyman outside. So I've got some mats that I know are coming from the right perspective, they're doing the right thing for the children, they, te they, they treat their staff very well. But when I go to schools that aren't in their mats, they will say, oh, they're taking over the world they are, they're just empire building. But it's not actually what it feels like inside. Best thing to do is speak to the schools within, because the schools within will tell you what their experience is, actually. So that's what mats are, that's what academies are. This is about process now, and I can do 15, 20 minutes on process. Any questions about that, about that world and where they're going? Can I ask, if you, if you go to be a, a grade four, yep. you're in an existing mat, and somebody decides that you have to come out, where did you put them, and did the other right. mat have, a, have any chance of what yeah. you get? Yeah, the first thing is, if you're an academy, or a multi-academy trust, academy trust or multi-academy trust, the DfE have no power to force you to take a school. So the first thing is you cannot be forced to take one in. 
The only power they can take a school out of a map is if that map is not being supported. In the funding agreement, you, you agree a certain number of things that you will do, and one of them is you'll support the school. So if the school goes into grade four, what they will do is serve a termination warning notice, which means we will terminate the funding unless you sort out the problem. So they won't immediately take it out, but they'll, they will give you time to sort it out. If you can't, and they do need to remove it, they do what's called a rebrokerage, and they will try and find another map that is, that is willing and able to take on that school. What they will do then, that that's expensive, because you, you, you have to extricate with the legal side of it, so they don't like doing it, but they will do it more quickly now, because they've got, they, if they've got other mats around that can take them on. What's not so easy is if you're not enjoying this experience, it's not so easy to say we're unilaterally coming out. So we as a governing committee are choosing to go, because actually it's the trust board decision. And if you think about it, if you create a small matter of four, and one school says, we're not in for this anymore, well, there might need to be four to be financially viable. So it does make sense that they can't just go on their own, but and usually there's a discussion to be had around that. Just a quick one. If, if um, you, the best match have got the same ethos and vision, yeah. um, how's that... I mean, how does that affect the map that will have church schools and non-church schools in it? Because there's a big thing there. Yep. And do all the schools in that map have the SIAMS inspection, or is it separate? Mm -hmm. And then standardisation of all the stuff. Yep. I mean, if it's a church school, there's certain things they want to see. Yep. It's different to other schools. Yep. What's your take on all of that? You'll, you'll manage the church schools as a different cluster within the map. I'm oh, sorry, the other thing is, 25%, what I'm told is that three of the company... Yep. Of the five, the five, that three of them have to be church yep. people or dominate by the church. Yeah. Are you in a VA school? Yeah. Okay. In a VA school, I mentioned twenty-five percent. That's in a VC school. Right. Voluntary control. In a VA school, the DAS have the right to appoint the map that the majority of the yeah, three three five. Yeah. yeah. So that's why in their model of MAT, they have the right to appoint the majority of the trustees, which is why you very rarely get a mixed map with community schools and VA schools. The mix map is turned to be VC schools and church schools because there's a high degree of control in the VA schools and that's replicated in the VA map. Your model where they appoint five, three of the five trustees, that's because you're talking about an ex-VA school or a VA school becoming a map. So we're, we're the, only local, the only local VA school locally. Yep. Then we've got to look for other VA schools else, so we're going to let this problem, aren't we? Yes, you will, and, and it's, it's, it's a national issue, that, that you will either have to combine with other VA schools or VC schools that are happy for the control level to increase if they join them out. Yeah, and only the church schools will have the sign inspections, not the... We're, 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 we're exploring yep. getting a, and the pyramid to work as a, as a pyramid that works so well together, mm. and that's, that's been schools that have been non-church schools... Uh, VAN yeah. and yeah. control. The, the clunky solution is to have a mat of the VA schools and a mat of the community schools and create what's called an umbrella trust that supports both of them. That's the clunky way of doing it. If you could have one mat across them all, but you'd, there'd have to be a real compromise. Either the diocese would have to say, in order to attract the community schools, we can't have three of the five members and 70% of the group of the trustees. Or for the community schools, say we'll accept that model to come into. But, it, but it's a, it, it's um, it's an obstacle for community schools to join, to join VA mats. And we've only VA school, and they've said they stopped individual. Yes. Uh, just you'll, you'll, you'll struggle to get an individual trust. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can mats amalgamate? Oh, well, hang on. Um, yes. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll come back. To that. Yeah. Sorry, I, I've, I've sat in this presentation in a number of different ways. I still don't get the advantage. You talked about yeah. consistency of ethos, consistency of uh, practices. You talked about between 10 to 20 plus mm -hmm. for financial advantage. You talked about local, there's no point being 30 miles away. Yeah. I can't see the advantage yeah. then. What between I'm, moving from the <coughs> local authority yeah. and becoming a mat? And I'm genuinely not, not selling it. I'm not selling it as an advantage. I'm saying this is what it is. So why it. are people selling it though? The, well, the, the, DfE, the DfE are making it happen, so they're forcing it from the bottom. At the moment, every school that's grade four will go, every school that is going to be coasting will go. Right. They intended to make the good and outstanding schools go, and they've, but they're, now they've given that up. Right. So the water's rising for schools that are struggling. In certain areas, I'm meeting groups of five or six schools that have regular head teacher meetings, of five or six people that have gone down to three. Right. Because two schools have gone and they've gone off to a sponsor. So they're saying, we don't want to do this, but we think it's the right thing to do now 
because we can, we can at least try to do so. I'm, I'm not saying that there's evidence that every academy is going to be better than maintained schools, because there's not. In fact, so much research has been done, and it's still a bit, mm, don't know, because uh, it depends on whether it's a good mat or a bad And is the proposal still alive that uh, local authorities can create their own mat? Um, that's a difficult one. The truth is that there's never been a proposal that local authorities can create maps. Sorry. What there was, was in the, in the white paper there was a comment that there's experience within local authorities that can be used to run maps. And what they actually meant by that was you could go and support your own map. Now what is happening is certain local authorities have set up organisations, trusts, to provide services to schools. They hope that in due course they will be allowed to take schools into those trusts. But none of them, neither Camden nor any of the other ones, have yet got to school because actually there's a rule within that charity company that it must not be local authority associated. So it cannot have more than 19. So we can't have the housing association situation. No, there. and many have tried it. <coughs> <Okay. Stop> it. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I have to say, there are ongoing discussions there, though, because there are discussions about local authorities having a minority control yeah. in maps that are run by school partners. So if you must have and experience of that. Well, I work for the local authority, and I suppose that's a similar model to, um, like, a found, um, a trust school model. Yep. <clears throat> because there, the local authority can be a partner, but it can only have 19.9% mm. of the, the, the share, if you like, of yes. those. But that has been something... I've seen that work in Kirklees where it actually, it does, it's a formal partnership and yeah. the right people around the table, some are schools, some can be businesses, higher yeah. education colleges, but it's the quality of people around the table yeah. that make the difference to the ethos. Yeah. So almost it's how you, come, you can get the best of that and that's something we're really keen to do as a local yeah. authority. So it's really helpful, you yeah. bringing that to life, I think. Yeah. So. And there are people that still hope to be able to do that, but you, it, yeah. there will be a very minority control, not a local party run that. The LGA, I think, ran away with it when the white paper came out, thinking yeah. this was possible. But it's, there's so many, it's, it's very funky to get it going. But, oh, thank you for doing yeah. uh, Matt, by the way, can merge. Um, there are slides later, but I won't go into them in detail. But if you get a small map, um, and I'm seeing this a lot now, a lot of small maps are merging to create larger ones because they want to get those economies going forward or, and they think it's the right thing to do. Um, similarly, a lot of standalones are taking a school in. When you're looking at taking schools in or you're looking at merging, it's really important for you as a group of governors to do the due diligence on the school that's coming in. If, and due diligence is just making sure that you know exactly what you're taking on, what you're letting yourself in for. So if you're a good school, you became a good academy trust or a multi-academy trust of three or four, and the DfE says to you, bring this school in. If you've already been supporting that school for a period of time, you've been in there, you understand what they are, then your due diligence is going to be less than if it's a school that's not very well known to you and you're taking it on. There was, I'm aware of a map that, you, that due diligence was too, sometimes it can be 100 pages long. I'm aware of a map with two questions. It's, what's your plan and have you got asbestos in the roof? Which didn't talk about... Yeah, projected finance, we talk about projected pupil numbers, staffing structures, have you got any safeguarding issues, all those things that reputationally could be very damaging for you as a group if you took that school on without addressing them early. So it's really important to know the, 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 the magnitude of the task if you're taking a school in. If you're taking an academy trust in, it's even bigger because actually they've been operating outside the local authority system for a period of time without the local authority monitoring of them. They've been subject to lots of rules and regulations, but whether they've been compliant with them is another matter. So if you are an academy trust and you're looking at another academy bringing it in, it's important, I think, to get accountants to look at how that's been operating for a while because you don't want any frightening stories. One thing I would say is there's lots of horror stories out there as well about academies doing the worst thing I think, which is abhorrent, which is paying companies that are run by family members and all that stuff. And it is awful to see that, but the good thing is you do see it. So in other words, they're being caught. Uh, and I think it's important that they have been caught. And the, the DfE are now making it absolutely clear you will be named and shamed if you're caught. Some people don't mind being shamed, it seems, but you will be named and shamed if you're caught. And it's important that, that, that you are if you spend the money in the wrong way. Um, a quick word about um, academy projects. If you're looking to convert and you're a maintained school, you still have to do things like consult and you still have to follow the, pro the process. Consultation, um, referendums. It's not a referendum, thankfully. <laughs> Um, and it's not an election, what you do is you, if you think it's the right thing to do and it's the right time for your group, for your school, what you do is you then put together a consultation that should take a minimum of four to six weeks, and you say, we're thinking of doing this, we think these are the reasons, the good reasons, what are your views? You don't say, tick the box if we should do it, or tick if you don't. Because the problem there is you might get 35 no's, or 35 yeses, 
and you don't know why, because they may have a complete misunderstanding of what an academy is. So a consultation is to take views in, and then you to take an independent judgment. I'm aware of governing bodies that have been very keen to, in effect, absolve themselves of responsibility and say, we'll just ask the staff, or we'll ask the parents. But you have, you have a duty to be informed and to understand and to take opinion, but still to take a decision based upon what you believe is the best way forward. So in theory, you can get a lot of no's and still say, this is the right thing for us, but don't ask yes or no, just ask for views. I had one academy that was going to be sponsored, and they went out to consultation and said, should it be an academy? They had to be, because they were being forced by the DfE. So a few parents said no, because you're being sponsored, we don't want coke machines in our school. Because they thought sponsorship means you get a professional sponsor for coke machines in our school. So if, if they said no without a reason, you may feel obliged to follow their no without realising their reasons were, were, were ill-founded. What I would say is that new Education Adoption Act has made some other changes. You don't have to consult now if you're being forced. Now that makes sense, because why consult on something that you've got to do? So it does make sense, but it's, it's still slightly worrying that you don't have to consult. So the process is, first of all, you must consult. Now, you don't have to consult before you apply to the DfE, you have to consult before you actually become an academy. So it takes a few months before you can become an academy. So you don't have to consult before you apply. And sometimes, if you apply, you might get refused. If you <coughs> consult, apply, get refused, you've then got to go back to the consultees and it's a bit embarrassing because nowadays you won't be going standalone, of course, you'll be consulting about a group. And it may well be that the commissioner doesn't think that group is viable. So you might get a knockback. So sometimes it's better to be open with your populace but don't do your formal consultation until you know what the proposal is that's going to be approved first. Um, in terms of funding, I mentioned how you're funded. You get something called a GAG, which is the General Annual Grant, which includes your current school budget share plus a bit of a top-up as well, Education Services Grant. That is being reduced rapidly every year. It used to be based upon the Section 251 statements. I don't know what they are. My wife used to be Head of Schools Finance for an Education Authority. Um, this is an example. 25 years school experience. Chartered accountant, ran the service, to save £150 million, they've moved her into corporate finance. With all due respect to Stephanie, she knows nothing and has no interest in corporate finance. She loves school budget monitoring and going to schools and things like that. But her three accountants allow you protection of your contract, and changes can only be made if there are technical reasons for doing that. Similarly to the moment, so teachers employed in a school, you won't be able to change their terms and conditions, you won't be able to do anything. If pupil cohort reduced, you'd have to reorganise. Similarly in the academy, if pupil cohort reduces, you'd have to make an adjustment there. So they do have <coughs> protection. But new staff coming in, you can employ on terms that are suitable to, for, the, for that relationship. And I find in some areas, the academy is paying a bit more because they feel that they can attract better staff if they pay a bit more. And some of the maintained schools struggle because they're on national terms. Pensions are really complex, but the best thing to say there is everybody gets what they already got. Teachers continue to be in teachers' pension scheme. Other staff get local government pension scheme. It's all the same from their perspective. So your staff are not adversely affected in any way. The Academy <coughs> Trust does take on something called the local government pension deficit that currently the local authority has to pay back in relation to. Of course, the local government pension scheme is investment backed, which means investments aren't there actually. It's been invested. Um, and you have to backfill in order to meet its obligations. So there's a deficit that's being repaid by additional employer contributions. When you become an academy, the deficit goes to the academy trust. So the local authority loses a bit of debt, but the trust picks up a bit of debt, and you carry on paying an employer contribution to pay it back. So you see it for the first time when you convert. I'm just running through two minutes of the next bits. In terms of property, if you're a community school, which most of you are, you get a 125-year lease of your school premises, so it looks the same. But you get it warts and all. So if you've got a leaking roof, it comes with a leaking roof. You get exactly the same thing. If you want then to do a capital repair or capital maintenance work, you apply to the DfE for funding to do that, rather than to your local authority. If you're a foundation school, um, you will get, you will already have the, the freehold of the land and you get a freehold transfer of the land to you as well. But it's worth knowing what condition it's in. In terms of assets, and that includes your staff, there's something called a commercial transfer agreement that transfers all of your assets, all of your staff, tables, chairs, computers and everything else, all goes over to the school. You can open as an academy without anything changing at all. You don't have to change the uniform, you don't have to change the name of the school, you can just open, you get all of the same things that you've currently got, so it should look, it should be smooth, hopefully. Um, the complications usually come with things like PFI contracts, but they can be sorted as well, but it takes a little bit longer than the legal process. And you get a grant of £25,000 per school, 
So a matter of five schools will get £25,000 each. There used to be an additional grant called a primary chain development grant. That was abolished, not coincidentally, the week after the white paper came out that said, you've all got to be academies anyway. <laughs> so that paper came out and they abolished the grant. It was supposed to be a sweetener to make you become an academy. Uh, we think that grant's going to come back now. We think that primary chain grant may come back. Um, I don't think it's worth going into projects. We've got the slides there, but that explains the differences when you're sitting on the existing academy trust or when you're merging the academy trust as well. There's an awful lot of ground that we've covered, and I think I probably exhausted you after lunch. <laughs> so, um, Um, I too have, have um, experienced presentations like that in various different formats over the last 12 months, but nevertheless that remains an extremely interesting, informative and engaging presentation, so thank you ever so much for that, Adrian.